Impressive demonstrations of grief accompanied Stalin's passing. In his death throes, millions of people crowded the center of Moscow to pay their last respects to the dying leader. On March 5, 1953, millions of citizens cried over his loss as if they were mourning for a loved one. One the same reaction took place in the most remote corners of this enormous country, for example, in a small village that, as soon as it learned of what had happened, fell into spontaneous and collective mourning. To the generalized consternation went beyond the borders of the USSR, many cried as they passed through the streets of Budapest and Prague. Three thousands of kilometers away from the socialist camp, in Israel the sorrowful reaction was also widespread, all members of MAPAM, without exception, cried, and this was a party in which all the veteran leaders and nearly all the ex-combatants belonged to. The suffering was mixed with fear. The Sun Has Set was the title of Al Hamishmer, the newspaper of the kibbutz movement. For a certain amount of time, such sentiments were shared by leading figures of the state and military apparatus. 90 officers who had participated in the 1948 war, the Great War of Jewish Independence, joined a clandestine armed organization that was pro-Soviet and revolutionary. Of these, 11 later became generals and one became a government minister, and are now honored as the founding fathers of Israel. For in the West, it's not just leaders and members of communist parties with ties to the Soviet Union who pay homage to the deceased leader. One historian, Isaac Deutsche, who was a fierce admirer of Trotsky, wrote an obituary full of acknowledgments, quote, After three decades, the face of the Soviet Union has been completely transformed. What's essential to Stalinism's historical actions is this, it found a Russia that worked the land with wooden plows and left it as the owner of the atomic bomb. It elevated Russia to the rank of the second industrial power in the world. And it's not merely a question of material progress and organization. A similar result could not have been achieved without a great cultural revolution in which an entire country has been sent to school to receive an extensive education." Unquote. In summary, despite conditioned and in part disfigured by the Asiatic and despotic legacy of Tsarist Russia, in Stalin's USSR the socialist ideal has an innate and solid integrity. In this historical evaluation there was no longer a place for Trotsky's harsh accusations directed at the deceased leader. What sense was there in condemning Stalin as a traitor to the ideals of world revolution and as the capitulationist theorist of socialism in one country, at a time in which the new social order had expanded in Europe and in Asia and had broken its national shell? Five ridiculed by Trotsky as a small provincial man thrust into great world events. As if by a joke of history, six in 1950 Stalin had become, in the opinion of an illustrious philosopher, the incarnation of the Hegelian spirit of the world and called upon to unify and lead humanity, resorting to energetic methods, in practice combining wisdom and tyranny. Seven outside communist circles, or the communist-aligned left, despite the escalating Cold War and the continued hot war in Korea. Stalin's death brought out largely respectful or balanced obituaries in the West. At that time, he was still considered a relatively benign dictator and even a statesman, and in the popular consciousness the affectionate memory of Uncle Joe persisted, the great wartime leader that had guided his people to victory over Hitler and had helped save Europe from Nazi barbarity. Eight the ideas, impressions and emotions of the years of the Grand Alliance hadn't yet vanished. When, Deutsche recalled in 1948, statesmen and foreign generals were won over by the exceptional competence with which Stalin managed all the details of his war machine. Nine included among the figures won over was the man who, in his time, supported military intervention against the country that emerged out of the October Revolution, namely Winston Churchill, who with regards to Stalin had repeatedly expressed himself in these terms. I like that man. 10 On the occasion of the Tehran Conference in November, 1943, the British statesman had praised his Soviet counterpart as Stalin the Great, he was a worthy heir to Peter the Great, having saved his country, preparing it to defeat the invaders. 11 Certain aspects had also fascinated Avril Harriman, 
the American ambassador to Moscow between 1943 and 1946, who always positively painted the Soviet leader with regard to military matters. He appears to me better informed than Roosevelt and more realistic than Hitler. To a certain degree he's the most efficient war leader. 12 in 1944 Alcide de Gaspari had expressed himself in almost emphatic terms, having celebrated the historic, secular and immense merit of the armies organized by the genius, Joseph Stalin. The recognition from the eminent Italian politician isn't merely limited to the military sphere, when I see Hitler and Mussolini persecute men for their race, and invent that terrible anti-Jewish legislation that we're familiar with. And when I see how the Russians, made up of 160 different races, seek their fusion, overcoming the existing differences between Asia and Europe, this attempt, this effort toward the unification of human society, let me just say that this is the work of a Christian, this is eminently universalistic in the Catholic sense. 13 No less powerful or uncommon was the prestige that Stalin had enjoyed, and continued enjoying among the great intellectuals. Harold J. Lasky, a prestigious supporter of the British Labour Party, speaking in the fall of 1945 with Norberto Bobbio, had declared himself an admirer of the Soviet Union and its leader, describing him as someone who is very wise. 14 In that same year, Hannah Arendt wrote that the country led by Stalin distinguished itself for the completely new and successful way of facing and solving national conflicts, of organizing different peoples on the basis of national equality, it was a type of model, it was something that every political and national movement should pay attention to. 15 For his part, writing just before and soon after the end of World War II. Benedetto Croce recognized Stalin's merit in having promoted freedom not only at the international level, thanks to the contribution given to the struggle against Nazi fascism, but also in his own country. Indeed, who led the USSR was a man gifted with political genius, who carried out an important and positive historical role overall, with respect to pre-revolutionary Russia, Sovietism has been an advance for freedom, just as in relation to the feudal regime, the absolute monarchy was also an advance for freedom and resulted in the greater advances that followed. The liberal philosophers' doubts were focused on the future of the Soviet Union, however, these same doubts, by contrast, further highlighted the greatness of Stalin, he had taken the place of Lenin, in such a way that a genius had been followed by another. But what sort of successors would be given to the USSR by Providence? 16 Those that, with the beginning of the Great Alliances crisis, started drawing parallels between Stalin's Soviet Union and Hitler's Germany had been severely criticized by Thomas Mann. What characterized the Third Reich was the racial megalomania of the self proclaimed master race, which had carried forth the diabolical program of depopulation and before that the eradication of the culture of the conquered territories. Hitler stuck to Nietzsche's maxim, if one wants slaves, it's foolish to educate them like masters. The orientation of Russian socialism was the precise opposite, massively expanding education and culture, it had demonstrated it didn't want slaves, but instead thinking men, therefore placing them on the path to freedom. Consequently, the comparison between the two regimes became unacceptable. Moreover, those that made such an argument could be suspected of complicity with the fascist ideology they sought to condemn, quote to place Russian communism and Nazi fascism on the same moral place, in the measure that both are totalitarian, is superficial at best, fascism at worst. Anyone who insists on this comparison could very well be considered a democrat but deep in their heart a fascist is already there, and naturally they will only fight fascism in a superficial and hypocritical way, while they save all their hatred for communism on quote 17 after the outbreak of the Cold War, and upon publishing her book on totalitarianism, Arendt would do in 1961 that which was precisely denounced by men. And yet, almost at the same time, Kojf had pointed to Stalin as the protagonist of a decidedly progressive historical turning point of planetary dimensions. In other words, even in the West this new truth, 
or this new ideological motive in the two-sided struggle against the different manifestations of totalitarianism, had a hard time in asserting itself. In 1948, Lasky had to some degree accentuated his expressed point of view from three years earlier. To define the USSR, he had again used a category utilized by another leading figure of British laborism, Beatrice Webb, who as early as 1931, but also during the Second World War and up until her death, had referred to the Soviet nation as a new civilization. Yes, Lasky confirmed, with a formidable effort given to social promotion of the classes that for so long had been exploited and oppressed and with the introduction into the factory and workplaces of new social relations, no longer rooted in the sovereign power of the owners over the means of production, the country led by Stalin emerged as the pioneer of a new civilization. Certainly, both were quick to make clear that barbarian Russia still weighed upon the new civilization that was emerging. It expressed itself in despotic ways, but, Lasky in particular stressed, to formulate a correct judgment on the Soviet Union, it was necessary not to lose sight of an essential fact, its leaders came to power in a country accustomed to having a bloody tyrant and they were forced to govern in a situation characterized by a more or less permanent state of siege and by a potential or ongoing war. Moreover, in situations of intense crisis, Britain and the United States had also limited traditional liberties in more or less drastic ways. 18 and relaying the admiration by Lasky toward Stalin and the country led by him, Bobbio much later wrote, after the victory against Hitler, to which the Soviets had made a decisive contribution with the Battle of Stalingrad doesn't really surprise me. In truth, for the British labor intellectual, the acknowledgments made to the USSR and its leader went well beyond the military sphere. On the other hand, would the position of the Turinese philosopher be all that different at that time? In 1954, he published an essay that attributed to the Soviet Union the merit of having initiated a new phase of civil progress in politically backwards countries, introducing traditionally democratic institutions, from formal democracy like universal suffrage and elected positions, as well as substantial democracy, like the collectivization of the means of production, it was a matter then of pouring a drop of oil on the machinery of the now completed revolution. 19 As you can see, the judgment formulated on the country that was still in mourning over Stalin's death was by no means negative. In 1954, the legacy of liberal socialism still resonates in Bobbio. Despite forcefully stressing the indispensable value of freedom and democracy during the years of the war in Spain, Carlo Rosselli had negatively compared the liberal countries to the Soviet Union, committed to helping the Spanish Republic under attack by Nazi fascism. 20 Nor was it merely a matter of international politics. In a world characterized by the era of fascism, of imperialist wars and capitalist decadence, Carlo Rosselli raised the example of a country that, despite being far from the objective of a mature democratic socialism, had left capitalism behind and represented a capital of invaluable experiences for those who were committed to the construction of a better society. Today, with the enormous Russian experience we can make use of an immense volume of positive material. We all know what the socialist revolution and the socialist organization of production represent. 21 In conclusion, for an entire historical period, in circles that went far beyond the communist movement, the country led by Stalin and Stalin himself could enjoy sympathetic curiosity, respect and, at times, even admiration. It's true there was serious disappointment caused by the pact with Nazi Germany, but soon Stalingrad had managed to erase it. That is why in 1953, and in the years immediately following, Homage to the deceased leader united the socialist camp, appeared to strengthen the communist movement, despite its earlier divisions, and to a certain extent was felt even in the liberal West, which was then engaged in a Cold War uncompromisingly carried out by both sides. It's no coincidence that in the Fulton speech which officially started the Cold War, Churchill expressed himself as follows. I have great admiration and respect for the courageous Russian people and for my wartime companion, Marshal Stalin. 
22 There's no doubt that, as the Cold War grew more intense, the rhetoric became increasingly hardened. However, in 1952, a great British historian who had worked in the Foreign Office, namely Arnold Toynbee, could still compare the Soviet leader to a brilliant man, Peter the Great. Yes, the test of battle ended up justifying the tyrannical drive toward technological westernization carried out by Stalin, just as it had happened earlier with Peter the Great. It continued being justified even after the defeat dealt to the Third Reich, after Hiroshima and Nagasaki. Russia once again needed a forced march to catch up with the West's technological level that had once again leapt ahead. 23. 